two, one, and we are good to go. And I'm recording. I'm to, I'm here with Samson Mao. How are you, Samson? I'm good. Thanks, Sunny, for having me on. Wonderful. So uh, I'm really excited about having you on as well. I know I've been we've been going back and forth for some time, and so I know you guys are super busy. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, okay. So I usually start with Samson around. I start around the topic of um, just to kind of get us started where we first met. And as I say that, I'm trying to remember. Was it like at a consensus, perhaps? Maybe that probably I don't know. It, it was. It was right. I'm pretty was sure it, it was New York. In New York. Okay. Okay. And probably back in 20, what, 15, 17, something around there. Right. Yeah. And then I think you invited me to Toronto for one of your conferences and right, right. That's right. You came and did you come and speak at one of them? I know Adam yeah, came I for did. one of them. You came for one of them, I did. man, you guys have been, and, and okay, we're going to get into it later, but I think you're from Canada as well. Right. Or at least I see we, uh, putting on a lot of Canadian gear. So we'll get yeah, to that. Yeah, so yeah. Canada. Yes, baby. Love it. Okay. So Samson, um, as I was, you know, prepping you earlier, more, like my favorite thing to do over the last three months has been every day. I try and capture at least one or two people's stories in terms of really, I, I treat Bitcoin as a singularity event. So it's kind of like, what's your story before you learned about Bitcoin? And then what's your story after you learned about Bitcoin in terms of how it kind of maybe changed your worldview or I don't know, the, the arc of your career or, um, entrepreneurial journey. Um, so with that, like I said, some people start back in World War II. Some people start with their first job. Wherever you want to take it, buddy, it's all yours. <laughs> all right. So by trade, I'm originally a game developer, uh, more focused on design and production. Um, I started out working at Relic uh, doing RTS games like Company of Heroes and Dawn of War. And then I joined Ubisoft to help them establish a new studio in Western China in Chengdu. And this was uh, back before the game industry really took off in, in China. So we were like one of the first studios in the city and we had to build up a lot of that talent from the ground up. Um, I'm also a gamer. That's why I got into the game industry in the first place. So I was a very hardcore Starcraft, uh, Warcraft 3, uh, Diablo 2, Lineage 2 player and real tournament as well. Um, and you know, the, the whole online gaming aspect was really appealing to me. And mm -hmm. I think that's what kind of triggered my interest in Bitcoin because you have games with these fully fleshed out economies. Games like EVE Online actually hire economists to come in and help them manage their economy. And being on the game dev side, you, you actually have to deal with some of that stuff too because uh, you have to deal with things like hyperinflation. Um, mm -hmm. In one of the games I made, it was too easy for the players to get gold coins. So we had to <laughs> introduce higher tier, more expensive objects to create that sink for the cash. Otherwise, you know, the cash will become meaningless and the game breaks. Um, but yeah, like um, originally I'm from the game industry and I just kind of got into Bitcoin just by chance. Um, it wasn't planned. Like uh, I was interested. I read about Bitcoin, but I never thought like when I read about it, like, okay, I'm going to, be a part of this industry and I'm going to uh, help move it forward and participate and build stuff. Hmm. Interesting. Wait, so I just curious as a kid, were you more, were you like uh, into computers? Do you remember even what your first computer was or not really? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, my first computer was like a big uh, blocky one where the, the, the CPU is built into the keyboard. It's all one piece. I forgot what model it was. And then you have this, the monochrome green monitor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I still remember like uh, when, when the, the desktop PCs first came out, you know, the, yeah. you the 386 or the, the 286 and everything, that generation. I remember and that. I think, yeah, around that time, that was when we had internet. <laughs> so I was around for the birth of the internet. So you you got the 56K modems. No, you had the 18, I think it started out with 18.8, right? Or something like that and then you have to dial in and first you actually had the bbs's so you have to dial into a bbs and sometimes like someone will phone you and you'll disconnect you from what was basically the internet at that time but even then like games were a very big part of that that culture right the, the early bbs era had a lot of games too on the bbs's and i started out playing i guess my first online game was called mutants and it was just a text-based mud where you go, you you move around the world by hitting uh, north, west, south, uh, east on your keyboard. And you kind of go up and down sideways and around and you execute commands uh, by text to like fight monsters and other players. 
Interesting. Hey, by the way, Samson, I'm 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 not gonna lie. I'm I'm a huge fan of StarCraft and have been for almost I don't know how long has it been around? Like since it's like for 15 years at least. 98. I took yeah. like a 10 year, 12 year hiatus, but recently with you know the the global kind of the pandemic and all that, I've been uh, I've been playing, so it's it's fun. <laughs> Um, yeah. So so so, how long were you in the gaming industry for? Then it was like uh, like a five years period, ten year period. How long were you in that space before you started looking at Bitcoin? And, and what was your first kind of you know exposure to Bitcoin? Do you remember? So uh, I've been in the game industry since two thousand and five. Um, that was when I first joined Relic, and I'm still in the game industry. So I still have mm. a game company. I started my own uh, called Pixelmatic in twenty eleven. Hmm. after leaving Ubisoft and that's still going we're bu building an MMO strategy game called Infinite Fleet and Sweet. Uh, okay it's it's going to incorporate a crypto asset into the game to replace the traditional game currency like World of Warcraft gold okay okay yeah. insane so, <laughs> that is so, so how cool. I got in yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like similar to you it's through the exchange route so my friend uh uh, Bobby, he is the C. He was the CEO of BTC China at the time, but I knew him before he got into uh, Bitcoin. So we were just like friends in social circles, hanging out in Shanghai. And then I think I went to his uh, Christmas dinner one year, and then he started telling me about Bitcoin. I'd I'd heard about Bitcoin before that, uh, probably in 2013 or so. I was reading an article about mining, and I thought this is really interesting. Uh, because you have this currency that is not controlled by anybody. And it, at the time, I thought it's like a game currency without a game company managing it. So that was what piqued my interest. But uh, at that New Year's Eve party, uh, he said, you know, you should look into this stuff and you should buy Bitcoin. And, um, you know, I, I tried to buy it on the, the app uh, for the exchange at the time and it was broken. And I said, you know, if you want, I can be an advisor and help you um, build up your mobile team and get it improved and functional. And then he took me up on the offer. So mm -hmm. I, I, my first entry in was just as an advisor because um, Pixelmatic's office was kind of next door to BTC China. So I would just walk across the street and go up a couple afternoons a week and uh, help out a bit. And eventually the COO left and he said, Bobby said, why don't you come on board as the COO? And I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. And I want to keep running Pixelmatic and I'm happy to do two things. And he was agreeable to that. And you know, the rest is history from that point. Fascinating, fascinating. Hey, do you remember though what it was about Bitcoin that initially, I mean, it was probably confusion off the bat, but like most people, but like just, you know, do you remember what it was that kind of initially kind of hooked you to, to the idea? I mean, you kind of alluded to the fact that you were in gaming and, you know, there's obviously points and gold and, you know, minerals and all that, but but yeah. uh, but were you like, I guess, Mike, where I'm kind of going with this is, had you ever questioned, you know, the source of money before? Was that ever something you were kind of questioning or was it more strictly from just like a technological perspective? Like where did your, how did you first really get in? Because I mean, to make that even leap to start helping Bobby, I assume mm -hmm. you must have at one point, uh, you know, got, followed the, the white rabbit. Yeah, so you're really spot on on that point. Like, I guess in our childhoods or when we're growing up, nobody's talking about what is money. You just accept it. Like you work hard, you make money and money is this thing that just exists. Mm -hmm. You don't think about what's behind the dollar, who's controlling the dollar, who's printing the dollars and who's manipulating monetary policy. It's just unheard of for us, at least for me growing up. I don't know mm -hmm. about you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And like nowadays, people are talking about it. We have a term, we call it fiat now, you know, and <laughs> we have fiat and we have Bitcoin and then you have money, which is encompassing both things. And, you know, fiat is slowly becoming less and less like money and Bitcoin is being more and more like money. Um, but I guess the, the, the aha moment was when I was reading about Bitcoin and I'm trying, I was trying to dig into it because the first article I stumbled upon, I think, was um, like I'm, I'm sure there are other articles in the past, like about uh, black dark markets and drug deals and stuff with Bitcoin. But the first one I came across mm. was an article about mining Bitcoin. And that was kind of what got the wheels turning in my head, because as I was reading this thing about how to mine Bitcoin, it dawned on me that there's nobody in control of this system. It's an 
organic system that lives and breathes on its own. Participants can come in and exit as they wish, and there's nobody that can manipulate and control the whole system. So that was what really got me interested in it. But I was really busy like starting up Pixelmatic, so I didn't really have time to to dive into it and um, explore it. Like uh, I, I think I tried to set up mining on my laptop, but it was too late at that time. But I did do go through the motions and, and download all the software I needed. I think I made a an account on Mount Gox and <laughs> other stuff too, but I never actually got it working because you know couldn't mine it, and then I couldn't be bothered at the time to to buy it. I should have, but you know, that's how it is. You never really understand everything at first read and then you're always busy with something. So my advice to people is if you hear about Bitcoin, really dive into it. That's the biggest favor you can do yourself. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you know, Santa, I'm kind of jumping the gun here a little bit, but just to kind of, you know, jump into the deep end a bit um, before we kind of hit the record button, we're, we're alluding to the what's going on in India right now. Right. Um, and, the, mm -hmm. you know, I, again, I was telling you that there's a lot going on. I can't talk too much, but there have been some things that have come out publicly um, that are already on the Internet. Right. Just the last few days. Um, uh, one of the former, uh, you know, finance ministers recently said some things and the former someone from the RBI. Said, and, and, and I'm paraphrasing here a little bit here, but what they, they essentially said, the, the, the reporter in both cases said, hey, look, you know, do you stand by this proposed ban? By the way, it's not banned yet, but they're, they're proposing this bill or whatever. And both people said, look, you know, when we initially introduced this a couple of years ago, our main concern was that we don't want people to think this is money, right? Um, but, you know, more recently, you know, with Tesla, everything that's going on, they're realizing that there's, there is a crypto asset. It, like it's if it's a cryptocurrency, it's no. But if it's a crypto asset like gold, something that people want to hold, perhaps we're OK with it with the right guardrails. Again, I'm paraphrasing. This was kind of what they were they were saying, even though that contradicts what the actual bill uh, because it's an outright ban. Um, anyway, so so curious. So uh, what is it then? Like, what is it like? Is it because, you know, people say people get mad at you. Don't don't call it a money. Uh, you know, that's it's not because only fiat is money. Right. So so just curious. Can you help us maybe understand it from first principles or something? <laughs> well, I, I think uh, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. So it, it is meant to be a currency that is circulated and transacted freely. I, when I think of a crypto asset, I think of more like um, tokenized stocks or equities or something like that. So, you know, Bitcoin is a currency. It is meant to be a currency. And I could get why some governments and central banks will fear it because it puts them out of a job and it removes something from the equation. When it's, there's like a, there's a lot of things that are analogous to gaming <laughs> or game dev in the, in the world. Like, when you um, give the player something, like let's say you have a warlock with certain stats and you nerf that warlock, well, the player is going to get upset and they might cry because you took something away from them. If you take the ability to print money away from the central banks, then you know they're not going to like that. It's like you're nerfing them and nobody wants their, their stuff to be nerfed. They want that control. So there's always this battle because when people have power and have control, they just don't want to give it up. And Bitcoin restores a lot of that balance. It gives power back to the people because as we talked about, nobody's in control of the system. It's really like the money of the people. And this is just something that has to play out in, 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 the, in the arena of uh, geopolitics and uh, governments and central banks around the world. Yeah. Um Fascinating. And, and you know, Samson, another thing is, is like, since you've been in this space, there's a lot of noise, wouldn't you say? There's a lot of noise mm -hmm. around. I mean, forget now the regulatory stuff, even like tech wise, there are a lot of, uh, how do I say this? Like hucksters, right? In this space, a lot of people who will, you know, kind of like a lot of hand wavy, oh, that, that, that yeah. white paper and a lot of shit's gone down. And how have you maintained a bit of a moral compass through all this, right? I mean, uh, in the sense that are there certain things that have kind of helped you kind of keep, because I've noticed you're, you've been, well, we haven't really gotten to the block stream part, but it seems like you've stayed, you know, pretty straight and narrow on the Bitcoin path, right? Regardless of whatever it was you've been doing in this space and how you've been contributing. But, but, but what is it that maybe, you know, now, I mean, in retrospect, a lot of people could say, hey, it's obvious, you know, a lot of these scams were out there a couple of years ago. It's, it's odd. But, but at the time, it wasn't so obvious. And now maybe we're seeing, you know, relapse of a lot of that. And how, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you, you know, kind of navigate through this mess? 
Well, I generally try to call out things that are scams. And that's why people say that I'm toxic or a lot of Bitcoiners are toxic because you know, we're dumping on other projects and calling them a shitcoin or whatnot. But the, the fact is that's kind of a service to the to world, to world because if you see a scam and you don't call out a scam, then you're kind of endorsing the scam. And the, like you said, there are a lot of projects out there that are basically ripping people off. They'll disappear in a few years. They'll get a lot of hype and attention because they'll market themselves as that next Bitcoin. But you know, ultimately it, it's very unethical if you think about it, because if they don't know what they're saying and they don't understand it, then they should not be promoting that stuff, right? If they do understand it and they're still making these false claims, then they're just malicious. But the end result is the same, that they're ripping people off. And I think that has something to do with governments trying to step in and protect people. Because if you look at everything from a bird's eye view and you take away a lot of the nuance and understanding, what they see is like this whole space is really scammy and they, they may not be able to understand like Bitcoin is legitimate and it is something that's really good and very uh, powerful for individuals to have and their solution is just outright ban so i think it's not specifically a ban on bitcoin it's a cryptocurrency ban so a lot of that scamminess has to do with the reaction coming from uh, those governing bodies because they don't fully understand that detail and I think it's up to us to educate them and educate the world that you know Bitcoin only and Bitcoin is the only thing that matters. Um, in terms of the moral compass, it's just like basic ethics. Like uh, I don't think it's good to scam people and it's not good to uh, mislead them. So for me, it's always been about talking about Bitcoin, trying to educate people about what Bitcoin is, what it does, and the why of Bitcoin. The, yeah, the why of Bitcoin. Hey, and something again. I want to. I want to spend most of our conversation around tech and blockchain, but I do want to do a bit of a TLDR on your conversation with Vitalik because I, I got to admit I, I blogged about it. You know, I think Vitalik's dad even responded. I like it. It was something that I think and talk about, and it, it was awesome. It was awesome. It was, it was an intellectual debate, right? And I. But what, what, was there one thing that that you took away from that that conversation, or or maybe you already knew coming in? Because I definitely had something that that stood out for me. Um, I don't know. I wish that I, I had more time, <laughs> and that Peter McCormack didn't interrupt as much. But uh, <laughs> no, I think it went okay. It went okay. I said the things I needed to say, and I think it was powerful that someone is saying that to Vitalik directly, right? Like having him on the pod and me saying, you know, that's a shit coin. That's a powerful message to, that people can get and take away from that. Yeah, uh, I agree. I agree. I, well, I'll tell you something on, on my note. I think it was, I think it was, I think it was a very like honest moment too. When, when Vitalik articulated the value of Bitcoin, because um, he, he went on to kind of describe like why people are so <clears throat> kind of caught by the idea and then he followed it by saying something along the lines that that he agreed that that you know ethereum didn't have something that it stood for mm -hmm. and 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 i thought that you know you can, we can talk about disinflationary we can talk pre mine we can talk before we can talk about all these things but i felt like that kind of spoke to something really strong i mean in in both in credit to bitcoin in the sense that you know, Bitcoiners aren't just, this isn't like a science fair project. This isn't something that we're doing, you know, on the side. This is something that we're devoting our life towards. And we believe that it, it might be our last kind of bastion of freedom and hope, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's not to be taken lightly. So, 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 so anyways, I, want, I did want to thank you for that. And, 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 and one more thing, one more thing. Okay, so the whole Turing complete thing, right? Okay, well, let's have it done so that every computer does it just from the get-go didn't make sense to me because again i'm not a guy a video game guy but i do play starcraft and i kind of know how video and i'm an electrical engineer and so i know kind a little bit about how these systems work in the background and from what i know they do use a bit of a hub and spoke and servers and like it, it felt more to me like when you guys were thinking or not you guys but sorry when the bitcoiners were thinking about side chains and layer two it was more in line with what science <laughs> and what, you know, maybe experience yeah. uh, was, was sharing, but, but, but did I miss something on that or, or like, you know, cause, cause, it, cause, cause I mean, now what, what, I mean, there's this famous quote by uh, Vitalik saying, oh, the price of Bitcoin, making fun of how the fees are high. 
And today, what it's a hundred dollars. Yeah. Exchanges are not listing it anymore. This or not listing it, but they're you know having difficulty. Yeah. So so what what's what's going on here for those that are looking kind of perplexed at this? <laughs> well, this is this is kind of why a lot of Bitcoiners are frustrated and I guess angry about Ethereum because they make all these promises that are not very much based on computer science, and you know having worked with engineers and engineers in the Bitcoin space, they, they just look at this thing and they see what they're saying and what they're planning to do. And they're just like, well, oh, that's not going to work. Um, you know, decades of computer science say that's not going to work. And well, we see that, right? Like you can't have every node compute and consume this crypto token as the gas and not have it become a, a unwieldy and impossible to use because that's just going to it, it only works if no one's using the system if there's like a hundred people using it yeah it kind of works it's, it's kind of like the roger ver thing like bitcoin should be for coffee payments yeah that works if you you have a couple hundred people using bitcoin to pay for coffee but the moment that system scales up it's a different ball game so one analogy i like to make is like imagine you have to pay with gold to ship gold well if the price of gold goes up, then the cost of shipping the gold is also going to go up. So it's not a very sustainable method because at some point uh, you're going to be giving away half your gold bar to ship that other half of the gold bar, or you just may not be able, may not be able to ship it. So I think uh, recently I saw a screenshot where Ethereum fees to transact like one ether were more than an ether, and that's just because of that system they designed, and it's not feasible. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. So, so I guess maybe Samson, thanks for, thanks for indulging me in that because, you know, I, I, you know, I've had a front row seat, right. Being in Toronto with the whole thing and, and I have nothing but love for the free market and for everyone, dude. But, but at the end of the day, yeah. you know, me too. Like I, I, I think just anyways, anyway, okay, let, let's move on. So to, Blockstream. To give Vitalik, sorry, yeah. to give Vitalik yeah, yeah. one, uh, one, some credit after the thing, he did post a couple tweets saying maybe people should not be so reckless with their money, putting it into Ethereum and DeFi projects. So maybe that interaction did spark a little bit of light in his mind about maybe not encouraging people going all in and losing their, their shirts. Yeah, man. And his father also said that, you know, this, this, this um, observation that I mentioned um, is, is Ethereum's both biggest weakness and it's perhaps its strength. I mean, I think so far it's perhaps played to its weakness, um, but, but who knows, who knows? I mean, you know, the world is young. I mean, the way I, like I said, the way I look at Ethereum, I'll be honest with you is I look at it like my, you know, Nintendo or my Xbox, like it's, it's cute. It's fun. It's like, I tell people about it, but not in the same way I'm speaking about Bitcoin. It's not even in the same like planet. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And, okay. And the, yeah. Let's yeah, go on. Yeah. Let's, yeah, yeah, let's, let's go, go on. on. Okay. So, so to talk to me about like how I don't know how kind of Blockstream came into your life, and I'm very curious. Like, like how did you end up in the role that you're at, and and you know what is Blockstream? Well, the road to Blockstream is uh, <laughs> a long one, and it starts at uh, BTC China. So, um, as you know, like BTC China was a an exchange and a mining pool, and as I was running the mining pool, we had to interact with developers and we interacted with uh, Mike Hearn and Gavin Andreessen. So back then, BTCC was a large chunk of the, the hash rate. We had uh, you know, 15 to 20% of network hash rate under our pool. And back then it was like much chunkier. The pie chart for Bitcoin mining was you know, maybe six or seven big pieces, uh, if that. And nowadays it's much better. But back then, like when people wanted to affect change or affect an quote unquote upgrade, they would reach out to the pools directly. And the, we had, I think Mike Hearn reach out and say, it's time to upgrade to Bitcoin XT now. This is the next upgrade. And that was kind of when I had to start getting into the politics of Bitcoin, so to speak. And as you know, the scaling debate raged on for probably a couple of years. It probably was going a bit before that, starting a bit before that, but it went on till SegWit 2X uh, and the UASF. But back then it was, uh, there's a lot of discussions. 
and some face-to-face -face meetings. So during one of those meetings, I, I got to meet Adam back in Montreal, actually. And uh, then we met again in Hong Kong, and uh, that was at the, the Bitcoin roundtable where we were talking about um, uh, the block size increase and SegWit activation. And I, I guess then we started communicating more and talking a lot more. And eventually, uh, I think it was another Bitcoin conference, I was talking with Adam and he said, maybe you should come in and join Blockstream. So I started considering that and the rest is history. Cool, cool. Okay, so my one of the first things that I'd ever heard about Blockstream, maybe this is true, maybe this isn't, was that you guys had something like 80% of the core developers, Bitcoin core developers on your payroll or something uh, at one point, maybe way back in the time, way back in time. Is that even, do you think that's even remotely possible? <laughs> No, that's not possible. Oh, okay. I mean, that's a common narrative pushed out by the, the RBTC group. But I think what it was is you have a lot of very prominent developers that were mm. a part of Blockstream when it was founded. Uh, you had uh, Greg Maxwell, like Adam is not a developer, but he's like prominent and very much associated with Bitcoin. And then you have uh, Dr. P Peter Woolley and you know, a number of other core developers. But at that time, it was actually much harder to get funding as a developer. Mm. So in a way, Blockstream's genesis was a, a way for developers to fund their own work on Bitcoin and protocols that are connected to Bitcoin, like uh, sidechains, the Liquid Network, and the Lightning Network. So just so you know, we Blockstream started working on the Lightning Network in 2015. So mm. this is all very early, and this is all prior to a lot of the the the. the the funding vehicles that now exist to support development. Hmm. So, you know, back then it was by donation. So this is a way for the developers to do their work, uh, advance Bitcoin and still get a paycheck. So, yeah. And by the way, Samson, for yeah. whatever it's worth, I actually was saying it as a compliment because uh, because they need to get paid somehow. Uh, and and I think it's noble work, obviously, right? And so, but yeah, I agree with you. I think it was maybe a misconception in terms of like some of the big heavyweights and whatnot. But I think that, that's not the case anymore as much, right? Some of them have gone on to do other things. But what was Blockstream? I know you guys are doing a lot of cool and crazy things, but um, but 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 before we get there, what was kind of the the earlier kind of you know mission initially, and what and you know kind of what was the goal of, of the company? Well, I would say the goal then and the goal now is to augment Bitcoin, um, to work on the protocol and to build technologies around Bitcoin to make it more uh, resistant to attack and to expand the functionality. So that is why we have things like the Liquid Network, why we have the Lightning protocol, uh, Lightning implementation called Sea Lightning. And this is also why we have things like Blockstream Satellite, which is they're all things to uh, scale Bitcoin and to expand Bitcoin's potential. Can, can you talk a little bit about the satellite, please? Like, like what, for people who are just like, what? Like, say what? <laughs> you know, like, what? Okay, is, are we putting nodes in, in space? Is that it? Or is there more to this? Like, yeah. So, a Blockstream satellite is uh, a constellation of satellites in geosynchronous orbit around the Earth. So, there are four satellites right now, five transponders. One satellite has two transponders. Um, and it's effectively broadcasting the Bitcoin blockchain uh, around the Earth. I think we cover most of the, the land mass of the Earth, except for some small parts, um, uh, just between Russia and Europe. And um, what we're doing is we're broadcasting the Bitcoin blockchain. So it's not a Bitcoin node in space. I, I think there's not that much utility for having a Bitcoin node in space by itself. Um, but it's really just a, a ground-based teleport station, which is comprised of this massive uh, dish that is broadcasting up and bouncing the signal back down. And the really cool thing about this is it, it serves a functional purpose, which is it can prevent a network split in Bitcoin if there is a split in terrestrial internet. So say you have an undersea cable cut to uh, a country, then technically if there's enough hashing power in that country, they could split off and uh, be on their own chain for a while. But as long as one person in that country is running a uh, Blockstream satellite node and getting the blocks from space, they would keep that in sync with the rest of the network. So given that we're investing all this money to build on top of Bitcoin, it makes sense for us to invest at the, at the base layer to help secure uh, the network itself. 
so yeah, so maybe again, uh, I, maybe I'm not saying it correctly here, but, but I picture Blockstream as like the guardians of Bitcoin. <laughs> you guys are like, oh. I don't know. I just feel like you're building tech that 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 helps people to, you know, for Bitcoin to succeed, really. Um, but the satellite, okay, so I have another question. I know it's a bit of a red herring and we talked about Ethereum, so I don't want to go down the way, but, 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 but Turing completeness, this idea of not just making transactions faster vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, lightning, et cetera, et cetera, but this idea of Swiss army knife on top of Bitcoin. Um, you know, I've interviewed RSK and these guys, I'm pretty infatuated with that idea just because it's on top of Bitcoin is Blockstream. Is there, are there, like, I know, you know, Unicoin is a part of the liquid network as well, but are there, are there, is there anything along those lines that's kind of, that I have, I talked to, by the way, I interviewed Paul Stork, I've interviewed Peter Todd. So I'm trying to come in on Bitcoin on many different angles, but I'd be curious to hear what your thinking is. Do you think it's completely unnecessary or if it is necessary, what are the best ways of maybe thinking about, you know, because like everything is centralized nowadays and I'm sure people are thinking about decentralizing video or whatever, whatever, I don't know. Um, okay, so yeah, <laughs> go. <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, people are free to do what they want. If they want to have a computation on the chain, then they will need that uh, smart contract functionality like Ethereum does, where it's, it's Turing complete and you're computing on the chain itself. But it's also very costly. And as we discussed, it's not very scalable. Uh, you can accomplish a lot of that without having everything on the blockchain. We're working on a smart contracting language called Simplicity. You can read more about it on the Blockstream website, but that will allow you to do some things um, in, a, in a smarter fashion. But it's not the same as like Ethereum style EVM smart contracts where you can write everything up and basically create this contract uh, with a lot of customized parameters. Uh, and the, I think the bigger question is like, is it a good idea? Because we've mm. seen time and time again that these smart contracts are getting hacked. And a mm. large part of that, I think, has to do with the fact that you're giving effectively web developers the ability to write a legal document. Uh, and they're not capable of doing that because they're, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's very difficult to create something that is that complex and secure. That is why you keep having these security breaches because it's just not easy to do. And when you introduce that amount of complexity and that amount of attack surface, you're just opening the door to hacks. And that is what we're seeing. And they kind of hand wave it away saying, you know, it's, uh, it's early days and it's gonna get better, but it's not getting better. And it hasn't gotten better because that's just the nature of what they're trying to do. They're trying to have web developers write legal smart contracts that are, are binding. And that doesn't really work. That's why they always insert back doors into these smart contracts too, or kill switches. And that is why Bitcoiners say, well, that's stupid. That's garbage because it's not code is law. It's code is law until you want to turn it off. And that defeats the whole purpose of it. Um, okay. So a couple of, a couple of things. So, okay. Uh, green, sorry, is it called green wallet? Is that what the name of it is? Like the, the wallet that you guys support, the open source one? Is that what's Blockstream the Green? Blockstream Green. We have green. two wallets. Okay, okay. Oh, we you have, have two. Green okay. and uh -huh. Aqua. Oh, wait. Okay. So okay. is there, what's the difference? What's so Aqua? Blockstream... Sorry, I never heard of it. Yeah, go ahead. I've heard of it. <laughs> so Blockstream Green. green <laughs> yeah. yeah. Blockstream Green is a, a multi sig wallet. Um, it, it can do two or two sig signatures. And the second signature is Blockstream, but triggered by your own two factor authentication. Uh, it's available on iOS, Android, and desktop, and it supports a number of hardware wallets as well, including Blockstream Jade, which is the hardware wallet that we launched recently. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm so excited <laughs> and, about that. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. And, and Green supports both uh, Bitcoin and the Liquid Network, as well as Testnet. Uh, but we decided that Green should be more aimed towards Bitcoin power users. So that's the direction we're steering in, both for feature development and for the user experience. We want to give... Okay more control, uh, more customizability and functionality for green. Mm. But Aqua right now it's just for iOS, but it's a mobile wallet aimed at beginners and novices. We call it the grandma, grandpa wallet. So when you download it from the app store, you can get running and access both Bitcoin and the liquid network in just, you know, as long as it takes to download an app from the app store. So it's a really quick way for people to 
get a wallet that they can receive assets in right away. And I've done some calls where we're talking to companies and exchanges about the Liquid Network. And I say, well, I can show you the assets. So go download Aqua. And then on that call, they download it. They give me their Liquid address and I send them like a Liquid Tether in like a minute. And they're always like, wow, it's so fast. It's so easy. Very cool. Very cool. So you guys have quite a few things, uh, it seems like on the go, right? So I mean, like, wait, but is the satellite thing a product? Or is that just something you do for humanity? Or what is that? Like, is that, <laughs> like, can I have a satellite with my name on it or something? Like a big one? I mean, I'm just like, what is that? Is it? What is it? So we, it, it's kind of a product and a service. So we sell satellite kits in the Blockstream store. Um, it's also something we can use ourselves. So uh, this was an update for Blockstream Satellite 2. But you can actually sync the entire Bitcoin blockchain from zero now if you are in the middle of the desert. So all you need is a dish and you align it to the, the satellite that's broadcasting in your region. And you can effectively start a, a sync of Bitcoin core from nothing up to the current block. So it, it's a way for us, like for, so we have our own mining operation. It's a way for us to actually start mining operations where there is uh, limited availability of internet. So you could run your whole mining operation by getting the bulk of your data through the satellite connection. And then if you find a block, you just broadcast it over uh, LTE or 3G or something like that. Oh, okay, wait, hold on, dude. Have you talked to, um, have you heard about upstream data? Yeah, I've, I've heard about them. You have. Okay. Interesting. So, I mean, I just interviewed uh, their head of BD this morning. They're based out of uh, Alberta or their, their main office. And long, the long and the short of it is like, he essentially at the end of it convinced me that, that what they're doing is helping to decentralize energy as well. Like uh, it actually makes it feasible for us to go in the middle of, you know, anywhere and look for geothermal energy. And now you can just feed a Bitcoin miner the side of it. Um and so what you're saying now is, is that that unit in the middle of nowhere that's pulling geothermal energy could communicate with your satellite, even if it doesn't have internet? Yeah, so you get the bulk of your data from Blockstream Satellite, <laughs> and then you just use mobile data for broadcast. Or you could even use satellite broadcast if, you, if, you, if there is no mobile data. Um, you can get an Iridium uh, transponder and broadcast through that. So you don't need any cell phone signal or anything at all. You could just mine using satellites. Very, very interesting. Um, and, but I, and what, would, what do I need to communicate with the satellite again? Some sort of communication well, you'll need a, a satellite uplink and those are pricey right now. But uh, downlink, getting the data from the service is free. Gotcha, gotcha. And uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, so okay, we covered quite a bit. I, I wanted to also just quickly touch on another topic, which is, you know, kind of important to me, which is privacy. And I think important to a lot of people, it's kind of become like a, a known fact. Oh, Bitcoin's not private. You know, companies like chain analysis exist, uh, you know, good luck with it type of deal. Um, and then there are attempts to make Bitcoin private, but just curious, like just because you seem like you're more in the know with in terms of what Bitcoin is maybe doing at the code level and all that, like, do you see someday Bitcoin becoming more private? Did you, or uh, yeah, and if so, like, are there certain things that need to happen or, or how does Bitcoin become more private or I don't know, just, yeah, questions around privacy. Well, there's, there are ways to transact very privately on Bitcoin, but I think the, the challenge here is the disparity between who knows how to do it and the bulk of the users, the ordinary users. Uh, if you do implement some privacy enhancing features in Bitcoin, like let's say confidential transactions, um, then you're kind of extending that to the masses. So you're making it easier and more democratic. So everybody can access uh, Im improved privacy transacting Bitcoin. The challenge is how you get that. Because if you wanted to add that, you it, it could become very contentious potentially. Just because with the um, with let's say confidential transactions, there is a possibility somehow that an inflation bug could be introduced, and it'd be undetectable because of that uh, privacy. Um, so I, I think it would not be a straightforward thing to change Bitcoin to have that by default. 
But the next best thing, I think, is transacting on the Lightning Network or on Liquid, because Liquid has confidential transactions, and it's had it since uh, it, the network launched in 2018. So we've been using these confidential transactions in the wild. You know, people are uh, making uh, blinded transactions uh, when they're when they're doing uh, trades and loans on HODL HODL because HODL HODL is accepting LBTC, Liquid Bitcoin, and uh, Liquid USDT. And if there is a case where there's a dispute, they can access an unblinding key to unblind their transaction to an arbiter. So th this whole system is already working and in the wild. And theoretically, it could be brought to Bitcoin. But the question is, how do we get it to Bitcoin? And is it going to trigger another war? And the answer may be that we don't do it. And we just rely on second layer solutions like Lightning uh, and like Liquid. Because when you're doing a Lightning transaction, it is quite private. And uh, with Taproot, opening a Lightning channel would also be more private and less uh, discernible. Sam, do you know what Shadow Chain is? No, I don't. Oh, okay, okay. Anyway, so okay, um, okay, so that that's fascinating. Thanks for thanks for helping me kind of get my head around that. But uh, but, okay, satellites, hardware wallets, you know, open source wallets for advanced for beginners. You guys are um, doing Liquid Network for kind of a, a second layer solution for I guess exchanges to transact. You know, uh, you talked a little bit about USDT being on top of this network as well. Um, I get how USDT works, by the way. I heard the news today, so good, good on them. I guess that's behind us now. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, 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 I was going to ask you: um, Have you ever heard of money on chain? No, I haven't. Okay, okay. So these are they're 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 on the RSK world, but they essentially are doing stable coins on top of Bitcoin without like having to have money in a bank account that is like, you know, that's a centralized, obviously, piece of the kind of the tether element, right? So they've kind of decentralized it. I thought it was fairly clever, but uh, anyway, just curious. But Samson, anything else on the Blockstream storyline? Any other things that you want to share that, I don't know, are in the horizon or that maybe you guys have done that uh, that I think people should be more aware of? Uh, nothing I can really talk about right now, but- Okay, that's fine, there's that's al fine. There's always interesting stuff coming out from Blockstream. Uh, I think wink, people wink, didn't nudge, expect nudge. that yeah, people yeah, yeah. did the hardware wallet that kind of caught that was bomb. Surprise. Yep, yep, yeah. yep, yep. So I love it. I love it. Okay, surprise is good. Surprise is good. Um, okay, so we've done your story, I guess, kind of sorta. We've done, you know, kind of the block stream narrative and you know, all the great stuff that you guys are doing. And then we'll just kind of bring it home with, you know, what is one thing that you believe to be true that most others in Bitcoin would or may disagree with you on? Do you think you you have <sighs> something for that one or you feel yeah, in so uh yeah. So, I mean, I was having an interesting discussion on Twitter with Alex Morcos uh, this morning about the UASF. And my, my perception was that uh, it was universally accepted that the UASF was a good thing and a very seminal piece of Bitcoin history that showed like the users dictate the, the protocol rules. But uh, he was saying it was a bad thing. Um, so maybe that is something that people disagree with me on. I'm not sure, but that, that was news to me. I haven't, hadn't heard that comment before. I, I'm not sure what you think. You lived through that era of history too, I, right? I have your hat. Actually, I was going to wear it today. I was going to wear it today. Ah. I have your hat. I am. Well, now that it's, you know, in the wake of it, definitely was on Team UASF the whole time. I unfortunately, unfortunately felt like I was stuck between a rock and a hard place, mainly because... Um, you know, even though I started Unicoin, I'm not the main, you know, show or whatever. Like there's, as you know, others that are co-founders or we have investors mm -hmm. and, and I'm actually a really tiny part of the show. And so, so it was a little bit difficult because, you know, not everyone has as much maybe time to kind of dig deep into some of these matters and I can kind of, uh, maybe see their point, but I, I am proud of myself for, you know, privately at least calling out all these people and, and being very, you know, somewhat Samson-esque confrontational and, and trying to, you know, speak my piece. But, but I, I definitely, I, I, I would have lost hope if, if um, you know, whether it be Roger Ver or, you know, I won't name, but, but a, lot of, a lot of people I had, I had conversations with back in the day. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a, I'm a fan of the free market, like first and foremost, like before I learned about Bitcoin, right? That was kind of like principally and like whatever I, I philosophically, I, I really gravitate towards. And so in that vein, 
I got nothing against Roger, nothing against Vitalik, nothing but love for them. But obviously, if I don't agree with what they're doing, or if UAS or not UASF, but like you know the whole S uh, Segwit two X and everything, if I don't agree with it, um, one thing I, I I try and do is is be vocal about my opinion, and that's why I'm doing like a daily freaking. This is gonna be my third or fourth hour of stuff I'm gonna be uploading today, Samson. So, um, wow. yeah, 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 and this is why I'm being super vocal because it's like you know, and I and I try not to just bring on the Samsons and the Adam backs of the world. I'm trying to bring on like yesterday I had a guy that did yield some DeFi thing, you know, and. But, but I, I try and ask them the hard questions that Sonny would ask them. But if he wants to do it, like, who am I to tell him? I'm not going to, like, you know, force him not to. But again, you know, it's important, I think, to ask those questions. You know, one of my saving graces, you used to come to my events, right? One of my saving graces was that, you know, Toronto was kind of like, for better or worse, like the, 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 like the, there's a tornado of ICOs and all that. But yeah. the fact that I invited Tone Vase and put him on the stage at like the height of every event while everybody else was pitching their ICOs to me, enabled me to sleep at night because I knew that anybody going home that day literally had kind of the antithesis, the complete opposite of what was, you know, what, what I view. Because, but, but, but I remember during that time to even think about, you know, a tone vase like worldview would be heresy, like pff, Bitcoin, like, come on, you know. <laughs> that was a, a big, that's a big shift. Like right now, it seems a lot more people are very vocal about Bitcoin only and calling out the scams. Whereas back in in the day, like at that time you're talking about those conferences, it was very much a minority. I think the tide has shifted a bit. Like if you look at Michael Saylor going on podcasts right now, he's very maximalist in his views and he's very articulate about all, all this other stuff. And, you know, you have a uh, Chamath, <laughs> like he was asked like, uh, do you know what this thing is? And he's like, no, I don't know. It was some, some shit coin. So the, the narrative and the whole environment has changed drastically from back in that day. And I, I think you did a great service um, bringing people into your conferences that do present that, well, in the past, the, the, the minority view. I still remember I was at one of your conferences and I, I was on a panel and the guy next to me was like an Ethereum co-founder. I didn't know it at the time, yeah. but I, <laughs> I think I said something like, uh, I forgot, but it was very insulting. And I think he, he didn't like that, but that was fine. Yeah, yeah, it's probably Anthony. By the, and by the way, Anthony, to this day, I, like, even though I, I'm not an Ethereum fan, I, I, you know, I, I do like Anthony. I got no beef. His wife and my wife, uh, they were in Brazilian jiu-jitsu classes together and this and that. They come to my birthday and I got no beef. But, you know, again, what do I, I, I can't sleep at night if I know I have too much exposure to anything but Bitcoin. <laughs> Um, okay, dude, this has been ooh, fantastic. I was going to say, you know, there are kind of two things that have been kind of gnawing at me. So just, just curious, AI, is that something that you even think about? Is that even come into your world at all? Or are you so far deep down Bitcoin that you don't even give a shit about it? But you're, you're kind of a gaming guy. You run multiple, you run you know, another company, this and that. So I imagine you have some, some view on it. Well, I, I kind of agree with Elon Musk. I think, uh, a super intelligent AI is a threat to us mm. in our current form. So now we're getting uh, into the tangent, but I, I think the the Neuralink idea, the ability to uh, augment ourselves with uh, AI without you know overwriting ourselves is the way forward because we're we're still imperfect in that sense, and we're uh, we're effectively walking around without a backup. So if we can kind of digitize our consciousnesses and integrate, then I think we have a better chance to compete against a super intelligent AI if it were ever to arise. And the interesting thing is like, I've actually woven this thing into the, the, the lore for Infinite Fleet. So there is an AI war where there is a super intelligent AI that arises and it takes another super intelligent AI to beat that one. And then there's kind of a, uh, a ban on AI in the future. So we'll see how it plays out and if it matches the story. <laughs> well, have you have you heard of a guy named Kai Fu Lee? He's like yeah, the, yeah, yeah. you have. Okay, so he wrote a book. Yeah. I forget the name of it. Super. I have it on my shelf. Superpower or something AIs and something like that. It's all about China. Um, you know, United States government, Google, and like these just essentially like a handful of companies and two governments that have all of the data that this AI thing, whatever it is that we're building is feeding off of, you know, again, I do wonder like, anyways, you know, like, like in the sense that like, does Bitcoin at least offer us some sort of 
redesign of the future, right? Like even data, like the way people's information is kept today seems so broken, right? You hear about people's identity being broken into it, whether it's like Equifax hacks or this or that. Um, so anyway, where am I going with this is I, 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 I fantasize about, you know, like in a world where AI and Bitcoin advances and continues to advance, like how do they, aside from maybe my Tesla, sending your Tesla a few Satoshis as it passes yours, because my calendar knows I'm running late for my meeting. Are there other ways that, you know what I mean? That the Bitcoin and AI become, um, I don't know, more, more like uh, more integrated and, and maybe just like things that we don't even imagine that are possible start to become possible because because of that but in a positive way <laughs> not in a let's let's like you know control your way yeah well i'm not sure if it's ai but i think uh a network of networks that use bitcoin to pay each other is interesting so kind of like that uh the, the tesla example you gave um if uh, you have an autonomous network that can use bitcoin it just makes more sense. Like, why would you want to, why, why would that network do a wire transfer or use PayPal, right? They would just use a, a native digital money on the internet to pay for services from another network. But you could have a lot of that autonomy and um, cross functionality be between different networks utilizing Bitcoin. Interesting. And, and I mean, really, Elon wouldn't have to do a whole lot for my car to be able to do that, would he? <laughs> Probably uh, like, because uh, my calendar is already well, integrated to it. It drives itself. I mean, sending a few Satoshis mm -hmm. over lightning seems pretty trivial <laughs> just with a conversation yeah, with you exactly. guys. <laughs> Not even. The, fir the, first step, the first step is Tesla has to take Bitcoin for payment. And yes. then the next step is integration. Well, well, first step is the putting the one and a half billion on and doubling it and making okay. more money than all their car sales <laughs> in like a month. <laughs> woo, woo! Sorry, yes. man. I'm so excited about Bitcoin right now. I'm buzzing. Um, okay. I mean, there are a couple other things. Ubi is one thing I touch on. I'm kind of getting bored of that topic, to be honest. I think Max Kaiser and these guys have convinced me that, you know, th that's kind that's of bad. a broke, a broke uh, you know, even thing to be talking about. And a woke thing is maybe universal Bitcoin something something is a ub he had a ubm universal bitcoin millionaires yeah let's get everyone to become that instead of uh um okay actually no i gotta ask this one too uh, before we close out china china yeah. <laughs> uh you know i think traditionally the, the the a lot of the one of the criticisms has been well most of the mining happens there i think to this day even most basic geopolitics right now i don't want to go into details but it's it's a little bit of a mess right um is 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 that some sort of a threat to the bitcoin network uh and and should people be still worried or have, are we way past that um you know in terms of i mean because i mean yeah i mean i think we're way past it but the whole china ban bitcoin bans Bitcoin or that the all the miners are in China, that's like a very tired argument. And I think it's just people trying to fear monger. So if you remember Ripple, one of their defenses was, well, you need XRP because uh, Bitcoin's all mined in China and controlled by the Chinese. It's like, good luck, your security, <laughs> like, <laughs> end of story. But uh, you know, the, the whole idea is it, it doesn't matter if there is a lot of Bitcoin mining in China. The, what, you're fear, what you're fearing is the potential uh, for the government nationalizing and taking over those operations. But that is like a, a, a super nuclear option because at that stage, why wouldn't they just nationalize uh, TSMC or any other company that is operating in China, right? It's just, it would just nuke the economy. There would be no foreign investment no more confidence in their marketplace if they were to do that. It's just, it, the likelihood of that is the same as the US government or Canadian government seizing some operations and nationalizing it because that would just tank everything. It, it might give them some, some revenue or some benefit in the short term, but long term, they're just wrecked, it's over. So I just can't see that happening. And the other thing is like, Chinese miners is, is grouped into one large lump. Like it's just this uh, homogeneous lump of people. They're the Chinese miners, but they're, they're like every miner is their own person or own company that is undertaking the mining. It's not like they, they're a hive mind that is focused on uh, taking over Bitcoin. 
Like everyone has their own motivation. Everyone is participating in the market freely. Everyone is investing their own money. So when I hear that stuff, I just laugh it off. It's just ridiculous. Okay. What about CBDC? If, speaking of ridiculous, I mean, that's a buzz, <laughs> right? I'm just saying is like the governments are actively saying that's allowed in certain countries and Bitcoin, maybe not just like, that's literally the, like the reality we live in today. So, uh, but, but we're curious, like, what, what do you think about them? Do you maybe not? <laughs> Well, here's the thing, like, and maybe this is that, that thing that Bitcoiners will disagree with me on, but I think CBDCs are fine because all, all fiat currency is government issued. So it doesn't matter what format they do it in, if it's paper or purely digital uh, on a balance sheet, or if it's a crypto token, it doesn't really matter because ultimately all, it all draws back to one thing. It, it, it's like a security. When... Um, when I invested in INX, like people were angry. A lot of Bitcoiners were angry, like, mm. okay, but they're using Ethereum. Like, it doesn't matter what they use. It's a security for a company that exists legally. So if it's, the security token is issued on Ethereum, if it's issued on liquid or paper, it doesn't matter because it's just a security. And that is just a, a rail for transacting that security. And it's the same for a CBDC, which is, it's just a rail to transact a, a fiat. It's no better or worse, but it's probably, this is where it could get problematic. It's probably going to be worse because if you force everyone to use that, then you kind of dial up that surveillance capitalism. You can trace everything. And the mindset of a lot of governments is to um, fight terrorism through surveillance. And the, there's just no end to that. Like, the, the, the ultimate end to that is you put everyone in jail, right? <laughs> or you lock them down and don't let them leave their homes, which is effectively the same thing. But there can be no good end to that, that system. Um, there is a way to do a CBDC correctly, I think, which is to use something like uh, confidential assets, confidential transactions. So, you know, I'm, I'm showing liquid again, but if you were to do a CBDC on the liquid network or spin up your own liquid network, because it is all open source, you could do a lot of good. You could bring privacy back to the people where cash is cash and people can transact freely. But uh, I think the, that's not likely to happen because they're so used to uh, being able to monitor transactions in, in the name of protecting the people that it's unlikely to happen. But if there was some government saying we're doing this CBDC and it is private, then you know that that is a very good government and they're, 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 they're very smart. Uh, but I keep saying last question. Have you ever heard of the Maverick party? No. They're, they're actually this party in Western Canada that like combines everything West of Ontario and they want to, they're like the Bloc Quebecois okay. <laughs> and they want to like break off from Canada and they're thinking about, you know, having new um, currencies and this and that and it's surprising how much support there is behind some of these movements. Um, okay, Samson, listen, man, this has been blah. Um, my brain feels like it's, it, I definitely need to go take like a long nap or something after this call, but, but, but where do people follow your trolling? I mean, your uh, tweeting, uh, where do people follow, you know, how do people get to know more about Blockstream and, and what else do you want to, you know, drop on people? Yeah. So, uh, I'm on Twitter. My handle is Excelion, E-X-C-E-L-L-I-O-N. And of course, Blockstream is just at Blockstream. Um, you're welcome to follow and, you know, see what we're doing. Amazing. Again, like uh, just uh, think the world of you guys, man, and, and great, great job, Samson. And yeah, thanks again for, for making time. So just hold on for 10 seconds. I'll kill this uh, recording here.